Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome to our lovely guest today, Kaz Holmes. Hi Kaz. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Okay, so Kaz Holmes is a textile artist based in Maidstone in Kent and she is interested in the connections between land, place and environment. Trained in fine art, her works combine mixed media with found materials and stitch and are best described as painting with cloth and stitch sketching. This is reflected in her publications, the most recent being Stitch Stories in 2015, The Found Object in Textile Art 2010 and The Co-Written Connected Cloth. To create her pieces, Kaz uses salvaged materials materials which are torn, cut and reassembled to create mixed media pieces which draw their inspiration from hidden or overlooked observations of daily life. She likes to use the remnants of domestic life, rags and cloths, pieces of old clothing which are handled and worn, evidence in human contact. She dyes, prints, paints with household emulsion and stitches. Kaz is also a very busy tutor, travelling around the UK and internationally, sharing her vision and enthusiasm for textile art, as well as exhibiting in the UK and internationally too. And it's wonderful that I found a spot in her busy schedule today to chat with her. Let's face it, the author of Stitch Stories just has to be on the Stitchery Stories podcast. So welcome once again, Kaz. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> so, excellent. Now, before we get started with your Stitchery story, would you like to share with us what you are working on at the moment and what has got you excited and interested to uh, get up every morning and, and get on with your art? Um, I always work on a number of projects so I can escape from one to another <laughs> um, when things get a bit bit tough with one. Yeah. However, at the, this very day, I've been working on a piece a series or some of the series which I called Reclaimed Landscape. Right. Another hat I have is as a tutor at Kent Adult Education and I've worked there for 30 years. Right. And over that period of time, I have done so many demonstrations in watercolour and various techniques. I have piles of these discarded <laughs> papers. And as I started as a painter, I thought, oh, I wonder if I can do something with them. So I'm reclaiming these landscapes and subverting them and adding stitch, bringing the two worlds together. Brilliant. Oh, that sounds really fascinating, actually. And how lovely that you, first of all, kept all these piles of landscapes, etc., and are now managing to reuse them. So that, that's great. Yeah, I mean, yes. And, and the distinction between paper and cloth isn't so distinct. A watercolour paper, particularly handmade watercolour paper, is made with traditionally with cloth rag. And mm. I was fortunate to see its production at Bartram Green and Company in Maidstone, when they used to make paper up until about 20 years ago. Right. So we, we know, we've now lost this grand tradition of hand paper making mm. in this country as such. But, you know, the, the distinction between painting and cloth and paper and other surfaces have, have never been very distinctly separate for me. No. And I do remember reading somewhere that you were particularly interested in, in paper in general. Did you go to Japan or something? Have I remembered that rightly? Oh, yeah. A long time um, ago. Yeah, don't remind me. <laughs> I am looking forward, to hopefully, at one day to revisiting the country. Yeah. Um, no immediate plans, but I would actually say that it was with the it was within the Winston Churchill Memorial Fellowship and the Japan Foundation Fellowship. Right. I was fortunate um, within two years of graduation to be able to study um, both paper making in Japan, and and it was through my research into paper making I reinforced that link between paper and cloth because paper is used for a lot of things in Japan, not least of all for traditionally for shifo, woven paper clothing, yes, momigami, a, a type of paper cloth that priests would wear, and a number of things from building houses right through to working, you know, the usual things for writing, bins and note paper, all kinds of different things. Yeah, I actually went to Japan a number of years ago when I worked for Nissan. That was absolutely fascinating. I remember buying some really lovely little kind of foldable dolls that you could buy and stuff I'd never really seen before and I thought oh aren't these that these absolutely wonderful so yeah it is lovely how you've managed to say bring the two back together again I think that's that's really interesting are you off on your travels again soon 
Um, I'm going to the south of France to craft your retreats to do a, um, a week of workshops. I'm looking forward to it very much. And mm. I'm in Inverness at the end of the month. And I think there's a couple of spaces still on that course. If it, people can look me up and find out what I'm doing there. Um, and that, you know, being my second, third or maybe fourth trip to the north of the border. Right. Um, absolutely lovely area. Um, and I'm really, it's with Diva Design, so I'm really looking forward to visiting because they're good friends as well. Right. You're moving around a lot, especially with your um, with your tutoring and so on. So I think that's the gypsy in me. Yeah. Uh, really, it is the gypsy yes. in me. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's still something that you enjoy, obviously. Well, but it's quite interesting because a, a, a project I did called 40 Yards actually reflected that those two worlds, the world of travel and home. Yeah. And as, as always, I, I love the idea of adventure. But when you're travelling, at times you think, oh, beam me up, Scotty, I want to be home in my own bed. Exactly, yes. <laughs> and, and the times I want to be, oh dear, I need to be out now. <laughs> you know how it is. I do, I do, yes. I used to do a lot of travelling earlier on and uh, certainly you, you have all these fantastic meals and you stay in all these brilliant places and then sometimes you think, I just want to go home and have fish fingers for my tea. <laughs> <laughs> right. So with with all of this excitement, how did you actually first get interested in embroidery and textile art and who taught you and what sort of things did you do, Kaz? Well, uh, that's quite interesting insofar as I have no memory of anyone teaching me mm. anything to do with textiles while I was uh, at home. Um, it wasn't didn't come up in, in on the agenda. I'd be right. out playing and drawing and doing lots of things, but yeah. don't have a memory of somebody right. actually teaching me to use a needle and thread or yeah. knitting or anything. Um, and while I was at art college, I was working on a tech, on, on a canvas. Um, it was a project we did in our very first year, and I really hated this recycled canvas. You know, we all had some old canvases to paint on as one yeah. of our first projects, and this painting kept coming through. I don't have much memory of the painting itself, except I really hated the paint coming through, <laughs> and literally shredded the canvas and started to stitch it back together very crudely. And thought, ooh. Oh, this is quite interesting. interesting and yes. I think that fascination with destroying and recreation has remained with me ever since. Right. You know, um, and I think perhaps in some ways was always part of my vocabulary. I used to pull things apart in the garden, not my mother's lovely flowers or a <laughs> bit, but you know, wanted to always find out how things went together. Yes. That's a very different story. Lots of people, uh, you know, talk about learning from their grandma or their mum or a bit at school sort of thing. But, yeah, to have kind of no real memory at that point is, is, is quite interesting. Do well, you say, yeah, you say school. It was the cross-stitch eight, eight yeah. that actually probably did for me more than anything yes. else. I would have outgrown it by the time I finished. I hated stitching that thing. <laughs> The number of times people have mentioned doing a cross stitch pinny or something like that. It's like I don't remember us doing cross stitch pinny at school. We did, oh, we did all sorts of other things, but I don't remember a cross stitch pinny. But yeah, it, it, it's either enthusiastic people, despite of the hideous thing that we all had to make, or just totally put people off forever. So yeah, interesting way of teaching people. Anyway, <laughs> who or what have been your major inspirations as you've made your journey through paper and mixed media and paint and stitch what's you know what, what's been your major inspirations over the years and has it changed to anything different currently um well one of my first and and for i'm forever grateful for the lasting inspiration she gave me was um my tutor Janice Jeffries, one of the tutors at Maidstone College of Art, mm -hmm. who in my time when I started to destroy and make things and picked up a needle and then I even learned to crochet. I, used, I, I remembered watching fishing nets being made in Norfolk and right. I thought, well, I'll have a go at that. Mm -hmm. um, became interested in what I was doing at the, co at the college and she remained my personal tutor for three years. Normally you have a tutor change every year. Right, yeah. And uh, I, I'd be, I, I know she was definitely interested in my work, but I like to think that nobody else knew how to cope with me. <laughs> <laughs> and so she, you know, really, really gave me sound advice positive reflection and made me very critical of you know what I was doing so you know I would be very great I'm always grateful for the lasting influence she had mm -hmm. um, and also having the opportunity to go to Japan um, supported by the Green family you know um, in Maidstone who, right. who really were good ambassadors for my work um, made me start to look at the world in a different way right um, so that they were the two major influences, perhaps in the formation of my career. But 
I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet incredible people. Um, the Polish weaver Magdalena Abakanowicz, many readers may know of her work, and please don't ask me to spell <laughs> out the name. I will, we can put it into the end. Yes, brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, send me that link. <laughs> incredible dynamic work, and her later work with the human form with burlap and sacking, was in, it was amazing to look at. Very poignant work. Yeah. Um, Japanese textile artists particularly, many unnamed artists as well, you know, mm. all of those women and some men who knitted, crocheted, made beautiful objects, all have been influences. And then you have the Norwich School of Watercolorists, fabulous landscapes um, and painters, um, you know, throughout my career who I followed. Mm. That's a, a real mixture. But there again, as you say, you're, you're into mixed media, so you kind of expect some of that as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, people like Paul Nash, how could you not love his work and, and, the, and the way that he used colour on, on canvas? Right. You know, we can draw our inspiration from anywhere in the world, from other artists, other textile artists, but let's not forget... The, the the most important lesson that you can learn is to actually open up your eyes and look at um, the landscape around you and what you can learn from nature and the landscape is is amazing. Yes, and I was just going to move on to that because you make a, a great reference in your work and on your website and blog and all the rest of it in terms of taking a reference from views from your window, old decaying bits of urban landscape, things that you're almost tripping over. And it's it's very interesting that quite often we go hurtling off to go and find the grand view and that famous thing and you know, there's nothing around here kind of attitude when if you just open your eyes and look, even the most common object when looked at in a different aspect or from a you know a different viewpoint can be extremely interesting. Yeah, yes it is. And um um, I grew up in Norfolk, and the saying or the county expression is to do different. And my father always said that's what I would be doing. <laughs> I'd be off mile a minute looking at things, doing things. I don't know where that interest came from. I think perhaps growing up in a pub as a child, you had to really entertain yourself a lot of the time. And maybe people don't get bored enough these days to go and entertain themselves. But I've, I've always liked looking at things, watching, seeing how they work. And that interrelationship recently, you know, between the urban and nature, and yes. nature has a beauty of it, its own, mm -hmm. but where they meet the edges of our world, I think there's a strange beauty there, and, and it's the world we're in. We don't, you know, um, we have a, an, an amazing country with a fabulous landscape, mm, yes. but, the, but I, I equally like to see the industrial buildings. They're there, they exist, they will always have to be part of who and what we are. Yes, and they've all got the, the stories in kind of woven in them as well of growth and then sadly a lot of them of decay. Um, and just, again, looking at those from a different point of view provides some really interesting images and, and so on and the, the stories behind it all. So, yeah, it's, it's good to see that point of view. When we've been talking about how you use paint and mixed media and salvaged cloth and, and kind of whatever you can find basically how how have you developed your techniques is there a particular favorite te that technique that you like to use Kaz and in why, why do you like using that particular technique or techniques so much that's actually quite a tough question to answer <laughs> um, <laughs> but no that's fine um, because I think we need to be put on the spot people want to know I, I, I've come to the conclusion and when I'm teaching it's one of the things I try to communicate with with students and participants and fellow artists who are on the courses mm -hmm. is that I feel that I don't particularly have a favorite technique it's an interrelationship with three core processes that I like within my work and they don't, they're not in a linear, it's not a linear process for me. So it's mark yeah. making, the different and various ways I can make marks, which can be with um, paint, with dyes, and of, obviously with stitch. You can't leave stitch out of the equation. It makes yes. a unique and beautiful mark on its own. And then the, 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 the layering, which is for me like a metaphor as well, not just for the physical properties of layering, but the, the layering we have in the world we see outside so that you see distance, you might see one thing on top of another, you travel through place, things are not really fixed, although mm. photographs will, the way we look at the world through, through a screen perhaps, 
we we tend to think of that fixed view. Yes. Uh, and 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 then obviously Stitch in all its glory itself. So yes, Stitch is part of mark making, yes. but it actually envelops all. It's the means by which my work is held together. And I've certainly, when I've been looking at your art that you've been creating, and there's, there's loads of lovely examples on your your blog and website. I always wonder where to start with things like that. I'm quite, I kind of come at things in a different way, but I always really admire this unstructured or seemingly unstructured pieces and the replacement and the connection with pieces of text. And it's something that I've, I kind of re- really want to get and do some, never mind get started, you know, just actually start doing something like that. And it's, it's interesting how you've developed those kind of techniques. I think it's it's all, almost in the, in the way that you might allude to uh, perhaps a fine artist or a painter of working. Although, again, I must be enforced. I don't see what I do or any other textile artist as being any less important than that. But it's a particular approach that mm. textiles, by its very definition, is o- o- almost in its construction a linear process if we're mm. thinking about a weaving of a cloth or yes, a making of a tapestry. Yeah. And everything I do seems to be opposite to that. I'm deconstructing and reconstruct- reconstructing and it's, it, I can make an allusion to the fact that a painter might work on a canvas and the canvas might be restricting in terms of boundaries. But if they make a mistake or they're not happy with a piece that they've done, they'll paint over it and then rework it. Mm. And it's essentially what I do. I'm just painting in space and in time and with the cloth. <laughs> that sounds a bit like Star Trek, now, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> me up, <Scotty. laughs> well, 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 after that, I know exactly where to start now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really interesting way of looking at it, though. To say kind of bit, it's not linear, and I I am a very linear person. I, you know, I've worked in IT for thirty years. You can't be anything but linear when you've done that sort of thing. Being a programmer, you have to you have to be a linear thinker. So, well, what, wasn't it the? Um, in, but in fact, the idea that we have the programs what was it zero one zero one? Please mm. tell me if I'm correct because you're the yep. program program. But that started with the development of a text, you know, textile um, machinery. Yes, exactly. And the same with the, the machines that they have on fairground organs, you know, with the dots in there that play music. They're a similar kind of idea as well. So, you know, something's either on or it's off. If it's off, it doesn't make a noise. If, it, yeah. if it's on, it does. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. Yeah. We've brought computing into um, the development of it. And in fact, this think. conversation, because you're such a good interview, is turning into my work. It's a reflection of my magpie mind. Look where we, look where we are now. Yes. That's the creative mind. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I, if something goes wrong or mm. it's not working for me, it, I will. I will pull it apart, put it back together, or even reject it. You know, it, because I've invested time in in the piece, I'm quite prepared to, to, to sacrifice that piece. Right. It's okay. the process that's important to me. Right. And in fact, a student on the course just, I did at West Dean, where I teach regularly this week, and yes. had said she came in and looked at my work and thought, you know, how, you know saw the simplicity in it by the end of the course she said I did not realize how much goes into your work she said and you needed to have all of that in your work in order to give that feeling of lightness and simplicity yes and th- and that's just like when people are excellent at dancing or anything it's the mastery of the craft which then enables you to make something look simple a simplistic feel to it but there's many, many layers of complication and experience going on in the background to create that that simplicity. So, which is a challenge, isn't it? Getting that across in a day and a half in a class on a weekend. Yes, it is. Um, but they were fabulous students. It's a wonderful place to work. However, they, the students really get an opportunity to see how I demonstrate. And I always use an expression for them to be kind to themselves because we have a lot of expectation about what we can do. Mm. And, and myself as an artist, and it's interesting to have that engagement because they get to see me make a mistake and things don't always go well in the demonstrations and I'm quite clear that this is part of the normal creative process and we all do it and we all struggle and there are days when I'm thinking oh god nothing is going right yeah and that's that's important that people as they develop their own skills realize that everything doesn't go perfect the first time and actually in that process of possibly things going not quite as you'd thought then you can create some new processes in and something totally different than possibly what you thought you were going to create in the first place, but interesting nonetheless. Yeah, you find a new direction for working. 
Exactly. Now back to your books that you've published. So we've had your recent one being called Stitch Stories, which I found while I was doing research for creating this podcast in the first place. I thought, oh, Stitch Stories, right, excellent. Um, oh, really? I'm, I'm honoured. <laughs> yes, no, I, 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 did, I did find you. Um, so you've got Stitch Stories, the found object in textile art, and then you've co-written um, Connected Cloth as well. So that, that was with that, Anne Kelly, yeah. Anne Kelly. That must have been you know, quite an interesting series of work to to turn your art and your approach and your tutoring whatever into a series of books yeah and I really hadn't had any idea that I was going to get into publications people had asked if I would write a book and Mm -hmm. I always kind of pushed that question aside thinking my life was quite full as it is and yeah I regarded myself as non-academic so but it's probably perhaps testament that you don't need to be an academic to be mm. able to write yes um, and I discovered I could write and that really goes down to Batsford Publications for having a faith and inviting me to write found object in the first place yes and I'm, I'm still very proud of that a found object in textile art I'm very proud of that book and it's get getting a resurgence um, and I can't, I'm beginning to see that each of the books that I've participated or worked on although obviously they come from the same frame i.e. me and what I'm saying mm. they have different angles and objectives within them and, and found object is much more um, a, um, connected to the way I work with found materials co- covering some things going way back in my linear history if we can go because yeah. you can only work in that way I'm yeah. going backwards to paper making and how I worked with paper um, and then working in collaboration I do a lot of community pro- community arts projects was yeah. very important that so led to connected cloth and how we can work with other people but finally stitch stories which in a sense is about giving people permission to write their own stories in their work and how you can access different ways of, of writing that story in textiles or mixed media work and avenues that you can use to develop those ideas which go beyond the, um, you know, the more traditional aspects perhaps of design yeah. that include those. I definitely have to go and have a look in more detail at those books because I say I do really like how you approach your work as well. So and it's going to be an exercise for me in personal creativity to kind of move away from certain styles and, and you know just try different things and take the risk. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes, see see what happens. <laughs> So moving on from your books, Kaz, what have been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far? Oh, I always think it's going to be the next thing because that's <laughs> what, not what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I, will, I, I mean, I would without doubt say that opportunities early on in my career have made me who I am today. So one of the high points has to be going to Japan. Yeah. It really has to. And then kind of being adopted by other places and feeling at home, even though it could be in Australia or with Fiber Arts Australia or in the Netherlands. And the opportunities that exchange gives me to with other artists and makers. So they're really my highlights and not necessarily anything individual, just being fortunate. Yes. So it's really hard. I, if you ask me to name one particular thing, um, I couldn't really do that. And even the smallest things, Having that ability to sit in the garden on days when things are not going so well, I can sit down with my sketchbook, get absorbed, and then things seem a bit better again. Yes, and that's something that our brain it, our brain needs to do that as well, doesn't it? Sometimes just switch off. If, you, if you're struggling with something, it doesn't matter whether it's art or any, any other thing or IT technology stop walk away stop struggling go and do something totally different and let your mind settle itself and you know think about something else it, it, it works every time yeah yes it does I mean one of the things that I, I look back on particularly a few years ago and I didn't know at the time it was going to happen but the Indian businessmen outside of India that they have a huge organization internationally mm. and I have worked in India and done some research work in India had given I was awarded the Pride of India Award. For me, that was brilliant. A, a nice recognition. It's a, yeah. it's, just, it's, not a, it's a small award, perhaps in, in the light of other things, but it, uh, it was lovely to have that recognition. And in somewhere totally different from the UK as well? Yes, somewhere totally different. And also the work, uh, uh, kind of being an ambassador for mm. 
work, you know, working in India. I had an exhibition called Traces, which I have Romani ancestry, so I was tracing yes. my ancestry back to northwest India. And I had an exhibition that toured um, in 2006 through to 2008 in the UK. Yes. And I think it did a, a great deal to engender English Anglo Indian relationships. So that was really lovely to receive that in recognition of that work. Yes, yeah, recognition's just, it's fantastic to get that, isn't it? Yeah. And really, I think just as a comment, it just goes to show that these days we can earn our living, kind of share our passions. You know, who'd have thought that an interest in mixed media and found materials and art taking you all over the world? Yeah. Um, whether people want me there or not, yes, it certainly has. <laughs> <laughs> no, they obviously do. But yes. I, 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 I could never have dreamt that's what I would be doing, literally assessing each situation. You know, one of the best bits of advice my father ever gave me when I was first give, given an opportunity to, to do a little project, way back a community arts project um, after I came back from Japan to lead a community arts project in the Medway Towns, and I, I said to my dad, I said, I'm thinking about it, but I'm not certain that I, I've mm. got the skills to lead this project. Uh-huh. And he said, remember, they asked you. Yes. So they must see something in you. You, were, you, didn't, you didn't apply for it. They asked you. So take that risk because they are taking that risk in you doing it. And I thought that he has a good and valid point there. Yes. And Sound as, advice from a working man, I think. Yes, and which you've obviously taken and applied, and there you are. You've got all these all these opportunities, and I think quite often we can all have that um, imposter syndrome. They call it, don't it? That feeling uh, of yeah. oh, why yeah. why me? I'm not good enough. And then you think, well, hang on, stop. They've asked you. They've asked you. They could have asked lots of other people, but you've you're the one who's been asked. So therefore, as, as your dad rightly said. Those people will know that you have those skills and that it is you that they want. So that's probably something, a, a takeaway for everybody, thinking, oh, I'm not good enough. Yes, you are. Just go, and, and isn't, get started. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. It is interesting. So they have this debate that on application for jobs that many women particularly will underestimate mm. their skills. Yes. Um, so I'm not going to say, ergo, what it says about <laughs> men, because it's not fair. <laughs> but, you, you, but it is. It's, it's yes. actually... Um, statistically that the kind of questions they were asking, many women always think they don't have the necessary skills for the job, yes. where many more men will think that they do. That and it's they not, do yes. It's not a criticism of either men or it's just how we, we are mm. as, as individuals. One thing, you kind of alluded it to, it to it early on, and I'm, I'm dying to ask this one, is when something possibly didn't go quite as planned. Now, you've already said that you're not afraid of just abandoning something, um, you know, if it's not going right. Is, is there anything kind of possibly recently where you just thought, oh, crikey, what's going on here? And you decided, you know, what, what you were going to do with it one way or the other, and then what did you possibly learn from that experience? Mm, again, that's a really quite an interesting question. I've actually wanted to get back into some um, simple monoprinting technique with drawing with monoprint as opposed mm-hmm. to printing from fan materials, drawing onto a glass plate. And I spent two or three days trying to work with various types of inks and media. And none of them were working very well Mm. and I decided that for once I I mean I will recycle and my students might well be working on top of my those discarded surfaces next term Mm, at the art school where I've worked Uh, effectively I've just banded the whole lot and I'm going to start all over again right because I still want to get my hand back into that Uh, not anything that's highly technical other than that hand-eye coordination because everything I work with, I like to keep, I always call it the kitchen sink mentality. Mm. The results can be very, can become quite sophisticated, but they're also very accessible. You, you know, I don't want to be dependent on equipment. I like to do things on, on, on the move. So, and it's something that we often undervalue is those things that we make with limited equipment with the control of hand, eye and mind. Yes. As opposed to the technology yeah, it, it's, um, it's keeping it simple, isn't it? We've, you know, yeah. you're saying it's it's understanding the complexity of keeping things simple because keeping things simple is not always as easy as we've said as what people assume. So, and as you say, you're travelling around quite a lot, so you don't really want to be dragging piles and piles of stuff with you. So that's that's a really good a good way of looking at things, I think. 
and also about that resourcefulness being able to create something if I can do it, I have very minimal resources when I travel. Yes. I also don't have a car, so that makes a big impact <sighs> on the way I work. Yes, yes. Um, I also have no vision in my left eye. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's a negative thing. I think it is part of who I am. Yes. And that makes me, and like anyone else, will have their unique circumstances. So, you know, it's a can-do rather than a can't-do attitude. You know, how many of us say, I, I can't do this because I don't have space to work. I can't do this. I don't have the time. Mm, yeah, you, don't stop me on that one. That, yeah, <laughs> you have to make that time. Um, and I, 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 can, I can make stuff that's horrible and, you know, got to love the ugly bits sometimes. That's a lovely quote. You've got to love the ugly bits. Yeah, I really like that idea. <laughs> Right. One one thing I was thinking about is obviously you're very busy. We, we've kind of managed to find a, a little slot between travels for you at the moment. How do you manage your project? So there's a saying, beware of long distant elephants. So it's those items that seem so far away, but they slowly creep up on you and all of a sudden there they are and you haven't done them. So how do you manage to keep all your work organized and keep track of your projects but still keep that creative juice flowing Kaz? I'd like to say that I'm really well organized and I have this schedule constantly in front of me and I can see them looming up coming up on either on digital means or in my diary mm. but I'm like everybody else <laughs> uh, but I, what I tend to do is dig away at these projects I know are in the distance mm. kind of do broad frameworks and and, and slot in time when I can yes. so that I'm not within three weeks at the end of a publishing deadline and still got half of a book to do. Mm. So I fit, I actually, t I, I think because I've always worked in the community, I've always taught, I've managed to find a way of fitting in what I need to do at, like a jigsaw. Right. Um, but it doesn't mean I'm suddenly realizing, oh, next week I've got to hand this copy in. Or mm. it, they, those, I think they exist for everybody. Um, and you just got, you've just got to have post-it notes all over the place is one good thing. They stick them on the wall, hang them in. I, I have this um, wire system in our kitchen, and anything really, really important hanging in the kitchen right. next door to where the food cupboard is <laughs> there are these things with wires and anything really really important gets stuck on there so I, i've got it in front of me you must do that right yes so i'm a very visual person i need to have these visual things yes to remind yes. me no that's that's a really good way of doing it and it's interesting how you're saying that you kind of slot things in and as you say you've been working with a lot of these community projects and teaching so you, you already have some structure that's you're kind of working with um, to then be able to fit other things in, in and around. So I, I do like the post-it notes. I, I, I particularly like those as well, I have to say. Yeah, and so. it's that kind of informal structure because mm. it's not, I mean, my routine is far from a regular routine. Define regular routine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think anybody, <laughs> I mean, that, has what we're saying is that yeah. people, you know, idea of the nine to five job yeah, is non-existent yeah. for me. Yes, and I don't yes. think it exists for many people these days. That sounds awful, doesn't it? But, I, you know, that idea of regularity. Yeah, well, I've been, on, I've been on both sides of the coin. So, um, yeah, I did the regular thing for a long time. And uh, now I'm doing my own thing for, you know, not a long time, but uh, eight, eight, nine years I've been at it now. So, yeah, it's I've, I've done both sides, but it's interesting. I really like project management and I do get a bit obsessed about de de deadlines. I'm the secretary of our Embroiderers Guild branch and I'm always happy on, right, we've got this to do and that to do. And everyone rolls their eyes and, oh, she's going on again. So it's just yeah, always and interesting. Those, and, yeah, and also those deadlines might come as a result of that you may be on the ball and, and want that information, but you can't go in. You know, I've learned to accept that some people or um, sometimes you, you can't push any harder than you can to get things done in the time you need to get them done because not everybody's working at the same pace the same or doing pace, it at the yeah. same time. You know, you, you can when you're writing a book, you might be waiting for an image or copy from an artist to come in and they have things going on in their life. And, you, you know, patience is a really good thing to have sometimes. Yes, that, that's, that's absolutely true. So moving on, therefore, to future plans, 
what sort of plans and projects uh, would you like to share with us today, Kaz? I know you've got so many on the go, but Tim, is there any kind of highlights that you're kind of really working towards that you'd like to give us a sneak peek about possibly? Well, getting copy in for my next publication, I'm not going to say any more than that at the moment. <laughs> oh, but... exciting, yes, so, so we'll have to keep so, an eye so out. That, that's that's on, the, on, the, on the ball at the moment. Um, let's just say landscape might feature in it. Right. Um, and then I have some exhibitions that I'm planning for for next year. Right. And again, because I'm dependent on other partnerships in that, I can't talk too much at this yes. stage. But one will be a group exhibition at the end of 218, 219 in the Netherlands. Those I can talk about is that I exhibit with a group called Art Textiles Made in Britain. Yes. We had an exhibition which we have every other year at the Festival of Quilts last year. And it's actually coming to my hometown of Maidstone, the Bentliff Art Gallery, this autumn. So late, well, autumn, it's winter. Mm. Um, Late December through to January, we'll be exhibiting in in Maidstone, which will be great to bring bring it to my hometown. So that's that's great. Yeah, that'd be a a real thing to look forward to as well then for you. And, and of course, I'm going to Australia again. I forgot about that. How can I forget? I'm oh. going to Australia next spring. Oh, Wonderful. brilliant. Where are you going? Where are you going to? I'm going to start off in Queensland. Yeah. And then I'm going to work with Fibre Arts Australia at their spring, uh, our spring, sorry, um, Australia. That'll be your yeah, autumn. Autumn, yeah. In April. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, must remember to put the clocks back this time, Glenis. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll be working with Fibre Arts Australia on, on, on their ed- work, textile workshop programme that they deliver there. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and we have, they, they sold out, they've sold out, so uh, um, those, those workshops. But I do have a couple of others coming up as well in Australia for those who are down under and want to join me. Just yeah. have a look out on my blog and they'll be up there soon. Fantastic. Um, and I love being down there. I love I love meeting my friends back in Australia. Yeah, oh, I, I love it. I've been there several times. I absolutely love it. I have no plans at the moment to go there, but um, yeah, really, really love the place. So how how great that you can go somewhere like that and do your work and share your art with uh, with people and do more classes. So that's fab. Well, and in fact, one of the pieces um, um, called Bages of Australia will will be at the Knitting and Stitching Show in October as part of the Embroidery Guild's Page 17 exhibition. I, oh. I hope I'm not breaking any rules here embroidery build <laughs> no it's all, i'm sure not they want as much publicity as possible I, i've entered a piece as well so that, that that was a bit last minute for me I, I think it did actually get there the day before the deadline but there again i, I didn't have a huge amount of time in which to get that one done so um yeah so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that exhibition as well i think it'd be really interesting to see how people have interpreted the idea and i've seen quite a lot of interesting pieces being developed on instagram as well so yeah i'm looking forward to looking at all of that so okie dokie well i think i'm gonna say our time's just about Ooh. up we're, uh, we're nearly we're, at, well over time, I think. we're nearly we're at 40 good, minutes as it is i know absolutely so would you just like to share with us Kaz, the best place for people to keep in touch with what you're doing Doing and how, how they can follow you and all that good stuff. I would go to cassholmes.co.uk and you can find all my links there. Just Google me if you can't find it. Yeah, well, I, well I, to say. I shall be putting those links on the episode. It's like a glorified blog post for this particular episode anyway, as, as usual, and some section of your images and, and that sort of thing. So, and I do know that you've got a Facebook page and... What about Twitter and Instagram or anything like that? I'm on Instagram. Instagram I yeah. do have a Twitter account. I have to say I'm not overly using it at the moment. I tend to kind of feel that I'm, I'm Instagram suiting my needs more at yes, the moment. But yes, I do. Absolutely. I am. I do. I do get tweeted now and again. Yeah, well, we'll um, certainly, I'll be certainly looking out for your Instagram as well. Right, Kaz, that's absolutely brilliant. I've really enjoyed speaking with you today. I can't believe how fast 40 minutes has zoomed past. As, as usual, yeah. I say that every time, don't I? But mm. um, yeah, it's been fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing your stitchery story with us today. It's been fascinating finding out more about it. And as I say, everybody, you can keep, a, a, keep an eye on what Kaz is up to with all her travels and all of her work and all of her exhibitions ambitions and all of her classes it's uh, absolutely brilliant so keep in touch okay then thank you very much Kaz that's been absolutely wonderful speaking to you and I very much enjoyed it thank you very much and now I'm going to have some quiet time which is a rarity yeah, yes you enjoy your quiet time 
Okay then. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye, Kaz. Bye bye. If you like this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitch Me Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling, and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories. 